Hi witches, I hope you are sitting comfortably. Today I am going to tell you the true story of Hell for Nog, more commonly known as Hellfire Farm, that sits on the edge of the Brecon Beacons near Kilwabare Motts in Sapawis, Wales. Our story starts in 1989. Bill and Liz Rich moved to the quaint, remote farm with Bill's teenage son Lawrence from his former marriage. As Liz was expecting their first child, the couple thought that the idyllic setting with serene scenery, rolling green hills and open spaces would be their little piece of heaven to start a new life. A small holding where they could keep livestock and raise their new family. The setting would also be a great source of inspiration for Bill, who was a successful artist at the time by profession, with the studio being the perfect workspace. When they moved in, they had high hopes for the future and things were looking good but things would soon devolve into a storm of strange paranormal happenings that would put them under siege by nefarious supernatural forces, shake them to the core and change their lives forever. It wouldn't be long following moving in before things started to turn sour and the couple would live through a nightmare that would last for six years. Within months of being at the property, Liz gave birth to a healthy baby boy, Ben. The first sign that something wasn't quite right was when Liz awoke one night to feed Ben. As she got up, Bill woke and went to use the bathroom, which was located on the ground floor. Thinking the footsteps pounding across the landing were too heavy for Liz, he quickly made his way back upstairs to investigate. He found that Liz hadn't moved from Ben's bedroom and there wasn't another soul around. There was no explanation as to who or what had been walking the corridor. Next, the couple were also concerned by the soaring electricity bills. One day they received an electric bill that caused quite a shock when the envelope was opened. The bill was for £750 over a three month period. And this was of course over 30 years ago, before energy bills are as they are today. This was something they could not account for. The family did not use so much electricity their bills always being far lower than that, so they had no explanation for it. This did not impress the utilities company, so even as they tried to figure out why they had such a high bill, they were being threatened with having their power cut off. Bill did a full search of the house, checked power connections, and quizzed his son on his energy usage. Even when the lights were off, something was draining the power at an incredible rate and their monthly bills were four times the expected amount. There was no accounting for why they had been using so much power. They concluded that it was being caused by some sort of power surges, but could not discern where they were coming from and their local provider could not locate the reason either. Later, they would discover that the barn was a focal point of the electrical energy, as even with the lights off, they would flicker in the night with an almost laser-like brightness. It was becoming very apparent to the couple that all was not what it seemed in the property. The disembodied footsteps throughout the house were being heard more frequently. They sounded like the clacking footsteps of someone wearing hobnailed boots as well as banging and loud snoring sounds. Doors had begun to close by themselves 
there were sudden temperature drops and putrid, unusual smells, including that of sulphur or incense, had begun to emanate from nowhere in particular. Despite bringing in professionals to look at the electrics and waste pipes, no conclusion could be reached for the extensive energy bills and the pungent smells. The mood in the house was changing. They also had the profound sense of being watched, which they would describe as overwhelming, tinged with a sense of imminent dread that they could not explain. This feeling of being watched was more prominent by the barn, and Liz would say, it felt like something was watching you the whole time, and that feeling is even more frightening than seeing things. But if something is watching you, then you have to assume its next move is to do something. And a sense of raw panic would come over me. It's like I knew something was going to happen. The barn would indeed become a sort of epicentre of weird phenomena. Liz would witness strange lights out in the barn, which she described as being like laser beams, saying, When I went into the barn, I would see blue-white lasers. I was terrified. You know logically this cannot happen, but it has. There were also numerous instances of animals there dropping dead for no reason or exhibiting strange behaviour, becoming agitated, aggressive or acting in very bizarre ways. After this, the weird phenomena would graduate to actual apparitions being seen in the dark corners of the farm. Upon returning to the empty house one day, Liz, who is now pregnant with their second child, looks up to see an elderly woman looking out at her from their bedroom window. As Liz stares in disbelief, the woman slowly melts away. Liz would later see the same old woman sat in the corner of Ben's bedroom, where she would again vanish into thin air. Other phantoms were a hooded figure that would appear at the foot of their bed. Another was a man with a head injury who looked like he'd been in a car crash. There was a seven foot tall, dressed all black and with the head of a bird. And a beautiful woman who seemed to be drawn to Bill and was trying to seduce him, among others. The children were seeing these spectres too, describing them the same way. With the mounting pressure of the unexplained occurrences within the property, work starting to dry up for Bill, naturally the couple considered moving. However, with a nationwide recession in full swing, they simply cannot afford to move. With debts mounting, they get cut off by their telephone provider and are forced to sell the car. As all of this was going on, the exorbitant electrical bills would continue to come in forcing them to conclude that the paranormal forces orbiting them were feeding off the electricity of the house. Adding to all of the strangeness was that Bill's artwork started to change. He began to spend more and more time locked away in his studio, feverishly painting, and his normal, bright and hopeful paintings would begin to take on a dark and macabre edge, sinister and more twisted and disturbed. He would also later claim that he had been frequently overcome with black faults and suicidal ideation. There were also instances in which he would scribble arcane symbols on the walls or go into trances he could not remember. His personality also began to change, becoming more unhinged, irrational and confrontational and he became obsessed with the occult. In the meantime, their son Lawrence began to display bizarre behaviour as well, painting his room red, going into bouts of snarling and spitting and having eyes full of a blazing fury. Bill would say of these frightening episodes, Between April and June 1990, Lawrence was getting so bad. I mean, unmanageable. He was spitting at me. He was swearing at me. It was not him, I can't stress that enough. It wasn't Lawrence, 
that someone else was behind his face, in his face, much older and incalculably evil. It was as if Satan was trying to get his own back on him. He was fighting for his soul. It got so bad that they sent him away to live at a boarding school, after which the possession faded. Liz would also have bouts of what appeared to be possession, suddenly going into a trance and speaking with a voice that was crackling and incredibly old, filled with equal measures of hatred and mockery. In an attempt to understand what is going on in the house, they seek the help of a team of parapsychologists. After a thorough investigation, the team conclude that the family are sharing their home with four entities, the elderly woman, two young men and one other, a much darker ancient elemental that is attached to Bill rather than the property. Shortly after the couple's second child, Rebecca, is born in the late 1990s, for the first time, Liz sees a large shadow figure hovering in the doorway of the kitchen. This is the final straw, and the family pack overnight bags and go to stay with Liz's parents. Hearing the family's troubles, a neighbour suggests that they contact Baptist minister David Homewood, who agrees to visit the couple. Following a longer conversation, David concludes that they are being stalked by a demon. Two weeks later, David accompanies Liz and Bill in their return to Hiel Fanog. Conducting a thorough search of the property, they gather everything that could be connecting the demon to the family. Having an interest in the unexplained, Bill's books on the subjects are boxed up and loaded into the car. However, it is Bill's artwork that raises the greatest concern for the minister, especially those pieces which have a darker theme. The following morning, David stacks the books and said paintings in the back garden, covers them in lighter fluid and puts a match to them. It said a flaming book apparently leapt from the fire to strike Homewood right in the face, much to the horror of all present. Another exorcist named Eddie Burks came to the conclusion that the house was under the influence of a pre-Christian presence. He would perform an exorcism during which the house grew noticeably brighter. Burks was fondled by unseen hands and felt a tingle in his fingers, the tightness of his chest, the pressure at the base of his skull and the tape recorder exploded into noise like a lightning bolt had surged into it. In the days that follow, the family moved back to Heal for Nog and the more Liz leans on religion for support, the more Bill withdraws, often working through the night. Alone in his studio, Bill's work begins to take on a much darker, more disturbing aspect. Still unable to move, the family have no other option than to live through the ordeal. The footsteps continue and the children regularly see the old woman in the corner of their bedrooms, intently staring at them. For Liz, this would become too much and unable to persuade Bill to leave his studio, she once again takes the children to live with her parents. Alone in the property, Bill's mental health declines Liz becomes increasingly worried about him and one day returns to the house only to find the power has been cut off. Final demands for bill payments scatter the floor and strange drawings and scribbles adorn the walls. Bill stands there, almost comatose and whispering about dead bodies walking through the house. At her wit's end, Liz demands that they leave the property for good Upon finally leaving the farm, their marriage never returns to what it was. And shortly after, Liz and Bill divorce. Finally, their ordeal is at an end. As for the spirits of Hill for Nog, the old woman was identified by Liz from a photograph that was found of the landlord's mother who had lived and died in the property. 
one of the two boys was identified by a renowned psychic as a teenager who had been a farmhand in the mid-19th century and murdered within a kilometre of the property. During the construction of Hill for Nog in the 1950s, the house was largely built from the stone remnants of the 16th century manor house that lay in the back garden. One of the builders confirmed that during the construction of the farmhouse, two old headstones were discovered in the rubble on which the house now stands. There have been many theories as to what was behind all of this strangeness at Hellfire Farm. One idea is that this was once the location of, and I'm sure you've heard this one before, a witch's coven that had performed rituals and devil worship at the site. Others are that this was a case of demonic forces intruding upon this family's life for whatever reasons. Or that an ancient Celtic deity had once been summoned by druids on that plot of land in ancient times. Bill and Liz themselves would come to the conclusion that they had received a curse during a trip to Egypt not long before they had moved into the farm. There they said they had visited the Pyramid of Cheops and had somehow incurred the wrath of the Egyptian god Horus, a guardian of tombs, with Liz even claiming that one of the entities they had seen bore a striking resemblance to the image of Horus. So riches, I hope you enjoyed this story and I hope you can sleep well tonight. Lots and lots of witchy love. Mm-hmm.